Alright guys, welcome back to part 7 of the Razor Crest series. And now we're going to be talking about render elements or AOVs, or also known as render passes, and how to do that in V-Ray. So if that sounds interesting, let's get started. So before you watch this video, you need to watch the video on how to install the OpenColorIO plugin for After Effects. I had a separate video on that, and I briefly explained why we have to do that. So if you have not watched that, please watch that first. Please make sure that it is installed. It's not readily available in After Effects. You have to go and download it. Okay, so if you haven't done that, please do that. Otherwise, let's begin. It's going to be really important that we have a set project for this part of the lecture. So to do that, if you are using the most up-to-date version of Maya 2022, you get this home screen. And you can set your project really conveniently here. So you can click this folder icon. And mine's already set. says what the project is. But you can just go inside that folder, click set project, and then click open. And if your project is set, it will take you to the scenes folder. And by default, scenes is going to have the Razor Crest version one or whatever you called your file. If you did not name your folder scenes, it's not going to work properly, or if you called it something else. So by default, Maya will only look for scenes in a scenes folder. So if yours does not open up the scenes folder, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not set. But if it says something like documents or users documents Maya 2022, then that's just the default path. And it's going to be really important that you set your project to your project path because when we start rendering out images it's going to put them wherever the set project is and we want them in our actual project all right so you can select that if you don't have this splash screen though i can just simply say go to maya and then show you the old way of doing it oh it's file set project and then once again you always double click the folder that you need to set and then don't click anything else so the folder name is the folder here then click select folder and then go to open then open up the scene this way for the next part what we want to do is set up our render passes so we can see those in the v-ray frame buffer as well so one of the biggest takeaways from this class is what is a render pass or an aov so this is a little bit confusing there's a lot of terms that kind of mean the same thing in certain circumstances so you'll hear me say quite often render passes. The render passes are the same thing as AOVs. V-Ray also calls these render elements. So if I go up to my render settings here and then I select render elements, these are things that you might be familiar with in Arnold. So these are your passes or AOVs. So AOVs are arbitrary output variables. And what that means is you can start extracting specific things from the beauty and the beauty is just whatever you render like just natively without doing anything else no other adjustments you just click render whatever frame it gives you that's called the beauty sometimes it's also referred to as just rgb color or just color so beauty is generally kind of the main term that you will hear but you can often hear just rgb pass so that's what that is so certain software calls these passes, certain software calls it AOVs, V-Ray calls it render elements. This is probably the least common way of calling it. Probably the reason that they do this is V-Ray kind of started it with 3ds Max and 3ds Max throws the term passes around like really liberally. So to differentiate 3ds Max passes, which aren't really passes at all, they came up with render elements, that's what I am assuming. But inside of Maya, usually going back in the day when we used mental ray, which some of you probably have never even heard of before, it was called passes. So passes are the same thing as AOVs, and AOVs are probably the most common way of calling it. So arbitrary output variables, which is kind of a mouthful to be honest, but basically it just means that you can arbitrarily decide what you are outputting in a variable. Okay, so you can just say, hey, I just want to grab GI. Just I just want to see what GI is, or I just want to see what the lighting is. Every render engine has like its own naming convention for what these are. And V-Rays is probably the most peculiar. Like it has something called lighting. Well, what what does that mean? But we're gonna go through these and I'll explain how they're used. And then what we're gonna do, we're going to render out this image 
and then we're going to recreate the beauty. So the beauty is basically whatever we render. So if we go back to IPR right here, this is the beauty, but it will be useful later to be able to say, hey, let's let's take just the reflections and we'll composite those separately. Or let's take just the color and composite that separately. Or let's take just the glass and do that separately. And the reason why that's useful is kind of twofold. So the first one is pretty obvious. Let's say your render takes 10 hours and you don't really know how reflective you want it or you might need to change the level of reflectivity later. Well, if you just rendered this image right here, good luck trying to remove the reflections. Like it's pretty much impossible. But if you could isolate just the reflections and maybe tint them or reduce the intensity or blur them a little bit, it's really, really useful to be able to do an After Effects or just in post. And the other reason is to be more creative or to composite a more pleasant or more realistic image. Sometimes there is a need to take specific passes and do certain adjustments to them. Like maybe instead of using that glare adjustment for the lens effects, we could do that just based on the specularity and we could make our own glare pass in After Effects, for example. Okay, so this is all kind of theoretical. Let's actually do something practical. Okay, so I'm going to stop this. And you're just going to have to memorize what you need for this. But there are many ways that you can actually composite. So I'm going to show you a way of compositing that's fairly straightforward. And it offers a fair amount of control. But you can go in a lot of depth with this to do things like changing almost anything after it's rendered. So you can change things like, I want to change all of the color of the ship, you can do that with passes or changing the shadow colors and things like that. I'm gonna show you a more simplified way, which is going to combine the shadow information and it's gonna combine the, the diffuse color or the, the base color or albedo, okay? So this is just to explain what they do. If you wanna experiment with some of these other ones, you're more than welcome to. Some of these passes aren't really useful as passes in the beauty. And some of these are just for like diagnostic purposes. You, what you don't want to do though is select all of these and just have them all render out. Because while the majority of them are always calculated when you render, it's not really taking any additional amount of time, it does have to store them all. So when you save all of these in an EXR file or it's just separate files, it makes that EXR file a lot larger than you might need. And it sometimes does take longer if it's just saving it. Some passes do actually take a lot longer to do because they're not part of the beauty, and especially for diagnostic or utility passes. What we need to do now is just simply take this render and then recreate it in After Effects. So to do that, we're gonna use these passes here. So these passes are gonna be a little bit different to Arnold AOVs if you are familiar with them. And these are also a little bit different to Redshift if you ever use that. We're gonna actually start with GI. This is the first one that we need. This is global illumination. Next, we're gonna do lighting. So lighting is the direct lighting or that sunlight and light from the sun. And you can either double click them or you can click add. Then we're gonna go down, we're gonna skip all the raw passes. These are really useful if you wanna start like extracting very specific pieces like you just want to grab the color with no shadows, for example. This is what the raw passes are for. I'm going to grab reflection. Refraction. So refraction is going to be for light that kind of bounces off. And refraction is going to be light passing through things like the glass. So you can still see a little bit of the light passing through that. So normally we would need self-illumination, or this is the same thing as emissive. But uh, the nothing on here actually has its own light source, I don't think. So we don't need that. And then we're going to do specular. So I'll explain what all of these do in a moment. So we are actually going to be using a lot more of these later. But to recreate the beauty, this is the bare minimum that we need. And we don't need self-illumination simply because there's nothing that illuminates. Okay. If something did have a little light source on it, we would need this. But we don't need it right now. Okay. So now that we have these, now we can go back to the V-Ray frame buffer and then start IPR again. So you're not really going to notice anything that changes here. But now if you click up here, you can see that we have more channels. So let's have a look at GI, first of all. And GI is going to be very, very dim here because we don't have a lot of 
light that's specifically illuminating the scene just from bounced light. We go down to lighting, you can see that there's quite a bit more direct light here, but a lot of the lighting of the ship is actually in the reflections. Because we have that metalness, a lot of this is now only in reflection. Then we also have refract, which is going to be the glass. And then we have specular. So the difference between reflections and specular reflections are basically the, the intensity and the angle that it hits. So you can think of specularity of kind of intense pockets of light that kind of bounce off at specific angles. So these are going to be things like highlights and you, you can get a little bit of, you know, like more diffuse specularity as well, depending on the, the surface. But the majority of specular highlights are going to be these really sharp, bright parts. OK. And then, of course, we have alpha and then we have our beauty or RGB color. So I wanted to quickly show you something here. So I've, let me close down my render settings. I'm going to go back to the ship. And then I'm going to turn off metalness just temporarily. I'm going to break the connection and I'm going to reduce the metalness down to zero. So now I'm going to start IPR again. So now this looks very, very different. It looks like it's coded in something. So now if I go back and have a look at these, now look at GI. GI is way better lit now. So if I go back to lighting, we have way more lighting. And if we go now to reflection, Reflection is only the reflection of the sky. So this is an important consideration that when you are using metalness, it is influencing how the shader is like basically taking in the environment. So when metalness is turned on, it takes whatever your diffuse color is and puts that basically as a reflection. So when you go to GI, all of that diffuse color is not going to be there anymore. Then we also have our specular. That's going to be pretty much the same. There's a little less specularity now because of the metalness is turned off. But if I go back to my render settings and then I decided to use diffuse color and then render that, go to diffuse color, you can see that we have basically whatever our color map was on our image here. So on our diffuse color, so whatever this one was, and this is a UDIM, so we can't actually preview it. But this is what the texture is as our diffuse color. Now, if I go back and then I turn metalness all the way up again and then render this. Now, look what happens to diffuse color. It's like black now. It's like there is no diffuse color. So just bear that in mind that metalness actually takes whatever your diffuse color is and reflects it. OK. So that will greatly change how your passes appear if you use metalness, because things like your GI and, and your lighting are going to be very, very pale or barely anything's on there. And the majority of that information is going to be in the reflection channel. Like almost all of that is in reflection just because of how the metalness channel works. OK, just bear that in mind. In this case, we do actually want that metalness map on there, though, because the material is actually metal. And it doesn't really matter as long as that information is in here somewhere. We're going to composite that and we're going to get back to the beauty. Right, let me just control Z this back to having that metalness map on here. And now we can go back to the V-Ray frame buffer and go back to RGB color. Now, if I wanted to recreate this, I'm going to click and hold the save disk icon. And then we're going to say save all image channels to a single file. If you're saving directly from the V-Ray frame buffer, it doesn't know where you want to save it. I'm just going to go into images. And then we had this from last time. So I'm just going to say Razor Crest test. And I'll just say passes, or you could say AOVs or something, and then click save. OK, so let's open up After Effects now. And this is the part that we have to have that open color IO plugin installed. So if you don't have that, you need to watch that previous video and make sure that, that is installed. If you're on campus, though, it's already installed, so you can just follow along. OK, so we're going to double click our project window, go to images, and then we're going to select this Razorcrest Passes EXR. 
And the really good thing about EXR files is, first of all, that they're lossless, or they can be lossless, usually by default. They can store up to 32 bits per channel. So if you remember, that's a huge amount of information. And they can store multiple channels. So this is what is referred to as a multi-channel EXR. All of those passes that we just created are now saved inside this EXR. So we're just going to click and drag this down here and then start our composite. So we only rendered at half HD, so it's 960 by 540. It doesn't really matter. It's just to kind of drive home the point of how you can begin to composite. So I'm going to do shift slash or the question mark key to kind of fit this up to 100%. And the first thing that you'll notice is that we have this weird fringe around the ship and our sky is gone. So to get our sky back, we're going to right click over the EXR file, go to interpret footage, main, and then we'll say ignore. So ignore. And then the next thing that you'll probably notice is that everything looks super bright. And that is because we're no longer viewing this with the ACES color profile. And by default, After Effects is trying to do this directly with sRGB, which is not correct. So let's make sure our project is set up properly. Click down here where it says the BPC. We need to be using 32 BPC. Our working space needs to be sRGB. That's fine. And then we absolutely have to linearize. Otherwise, the results that we get are not going to be correct. So click OK. And as I explained in the, the last video, if I go back to Maya here, what we just saved is actually this image with no display correction on it. After Effects is adding this back on, but V-Ray by default and Maya and everything, everything looks at this image as it is with no display correction on it. And this display correction or display transform is what allows us to see it properly, but we actually only save out that linear file like this. And then in After Effects, we have to deal with that linear file. Okay, so the next thing that we have to do here is create the adjustment layer for the Open Color IO plugin. Let's right click, New, Adjustment Layer. So you can just click Enter and then type in OCIO. And then we're going to grab the Open Color IO plugin and then click and drag this over to our effects controls. So for the configuration, click where it says None, go to Custom, and if you don't know where that path is again, just go back to Maya, click on this folder icon here under display correction, just copy this path that you just pasted in here, enter, then grab the config OCIO file. And what we need is display. For the input space, we go to scene linear, ASUS CG. And now this looks like super blown out, and that's because After Effects is it doesn't know that this plugin here is doing gamma correction or just like a display transform, and it's doing its own as well. So we basically get two. So now it looks super bright. So in order to fix that, we can add a color profile converter effect underneath the OCIO plugin. Our input now is sRGB because we're viewing this in sRGB now. And then on the output profile, we're still in sRGB, but we need to linearize it like this. So now we're going to get the correct result. So this is exactly what we had in the V-Ray frame buffer. So if we just alt tab this back, now you can see this is what we saw in V-Ray. And this is what we get in After Effects. If this does not look the same for you, and any time that you're ever trying to do any compositing, if it doesn't look exactly the same, you need to sort that out because it's going to be very, very difficult to continue working on this if there's a disconnect between what you do in Maya and what you see in After Effects or Fusion or Nuke or whatever you're using or, or Photoshop. Now, I will say for Photoshop, you are not going to be able to composite these properly because right now Photoshop doesn't have a very good ASUS management system. So it doesn't have an open color IO plugin that works particularly well. So I'm sure they will fix that, but uh, right now you can't really get the same result in Photoshop very easily. But if you are compositing, After Effects is ultimately a far better tool than Photoshop, unless you need to do painting on it. But then you can always just take this into Photoshop, do some stuff, and then bring in a PSD back into After Effects. So 
After Effects is going to be superior in most cases for doing more advanced compositing. Anyway, kind of got sidetracked there. Okay, so what we need to do now is then break apart this EXR into all of its different passes. So the very first thing that we're going to do, we're going to duplicate this once. Then on the t upper layer, I'm going to call this beauty. So this is our reference file. And then on this file right here, we're going to grab another effect called extractor. So for extractor, you can kind of see how this is named. The E, X, and R are all capitalized because it's extracting channels from EXR files. I'm going to click and drag that over here. And in order to see this, we need to solo this layer. And when you solo this layer, the OCIO plugin is not soloed, so we also want to solo that. Everything that you do in After Effects at, at this point has to be underneath the Open Color IO plugin. So all of your color correction, everything, nothing can go above this layer. Okay. The only exception is your slate, but your slate is never going to be affected by your Open Color IO plugin anyway. It shouldn't be because your slate starts at frame zero, and if we're working on a project and stuff these will actually only start at frame one like that. But for this, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so just make sure both of these are soloed. And then for extractor, you select where it says layers. And if you select this and nothing happens, that means you didn't save out a multi-channel EXR file or you didn't save your passes or, or your passes didn't render or something. Okay, so let's start with GI. And GI is going to be like pretty much completely black, but there's like a few parts where there was bounced light. So we do need to include that. Most of the time when you composite with GI, it's going to be a lot brighter. But remember, our plane is pretty much all metal and all of that information gets stored in the reflection pass. So we're going to call this GI. Just click enter and then say GI. I'm going to do control D to duplicate that. The next pass is called lighting. We can say lighting like this. So we're seeing a little bit more information there. And then we're going to duplicate this again. We can do reflect or reflection. Then we can grab the reflect. Now this is where the majority of our information is going to be because we are using that metal. Got a specular. And then duplicate this one more time. And then we're going to do refract. So I like to keep reflection and specular next to each other because specularity and reflections are like almost the same thing. And in, in, in physics, like it's just a reflection. This is how it reflects that kind of differentiates it. But for us as artists, it's much more useful to have specular type reflections in a separate pass than it is inside the reflections pass. Okay, so then how do we actually combine all of these together? Well, one easy way to do it we unsolo all of these now. On GI, we're going to leave that with a normal blending mode. And just to review here, if you don't see your modes here, if you see toggle switches, you can click that. Or you can right click up here, columns, and just make sure that your modes and switches are both checked. So GI is always going to be normal, but most of the other passes are actually just going to be additive. And I just realized that the beauty also got turned back on. I'm going to turn that off now. And if we just go layer at a time, so we say GI, and then lighting, and we can grab lighting, and then we're going to add lighting. So in After Effects, there's two ways you can do this. You can do add, or you can do linear dodge. You will find certain people saying linear dodge is correct, other people saying add is correct. Really, it's just how it fills in color when you're not at 100%, but at 100%, add and linear dodge are exactly the same. So in this case, it doesn't really matter. So you can just click add. And now you can see that's a little bit brighter. You can solo on reflection now, and this is going to add a, make a big difference. You can say add. And now you can see a little bit more information popped up there. Now for specular, solo this on, add. And now you can see if we toggle this on and off, now we get the specular reflections. Same thing for refract. We're going to say add. And basically, we just add everything. And there will be some certain passes where we don't. So when we do ambient occlusion, we're not going to do that. Where we multiply ambient occlusion. But everything else, we just add or linear dodge it. And we're usually good to go. So now I'm going to turn all these layers off. Okay, 
So the last thing that we need to do is grab the sky. And this is going to lead us into kind of an issue with compositing like this. And that is the way that the extractor works is not going to take into account what the background was because we had an alpha channel. So just to show, we don't actually have a pass called alpha, but if we wanted to create an alpha pass for this, we can do control D again and type in alpha. And in order to see your alpha channel, you can simply go to on the red, green, and blue, you can just say A, A, A. So then we don't actually add that. That would be just normal. And that is what our alpha channel looks like. Now keep in mind that the ACES color profile is making this look a lot dimmer. So if we were to solo this, then it looks like we would expect, you know, black and white. But we need this OCIO plugin on, and it's going to make everything look a little bit more dimmed. And that's okay. That's the way that we're going to composite. All right, so that's how you grab your alpha, but we still don't have our sky. But if we click our toggle transparency grid here, you can see that one of these layers is blocking the alpha. So all of these layers by default don't really preserve that alpha channel. So then we could use this alpha channel that we just created, and use it as a mat for every single one of these channels. That's a little bit cumbersome. We could pre-compose these, but that kind of screws up how we're going to do the rest of our compositing. So we're not going to do that. Instead, what we can do is go to each one of these passes and make sure the alpha channel is being used. You can do it this way. And now you can see that with the alpha transparency turned on, now we finally have transparency. So to get our sky back, we can simply go to our beauty because that included the sky. We could duplicate that, call that sky, turn that layer on, pull that underneath GI, and hey, look, we've got, we've got our sky back. So this is going to lead us into the next section where we start talking about render layers. And render layers is going to solve this problem so we never actually have to do that because that is really cumbersome to have to do. But if you didn't need render layers and you did want to have like, you know, full control, that's one way that you can do it. As always, there's lots of different ways that you can use to kind of extract the alpha from an image and stuff like that. But that's one way of doing it. And I think it's pretty straightforward. OK, so now let's compare this to the beauty again. So if we turn this layer on, so we're toggling this on and off. We have now the same image. Now, there is one nuanced difference here, and that is around the edges. This is a problem that often occurs, and it's how the image is extracted from the alpha. And it can lead to some fringing, and sometimes that's problematic. Usually, though, it's not that problematic. There are ways to mitigate that edge if it becomes a problem, but it's very, very subtle here, like that. So we can talk about ways that you can alleviate that issue. And sometimes it's as easy as unmultiplying your EXR passes or going into your interpret footage and interpreting this as, as pre-multiplied. It just depends. So that is how you can get back to your beauty. Now, I wanted to show you some other things that you could do with passes before we move on to render layers. So let's go into our render settings again. And this time I want to look at glossiness. So I'm going to go down to reflection glossiness. So reflection glossiness is not actually part of the beauty, but this is the same thing as roughness for us. So let's just render this. And this is really useful for us if we wanted to use this to control parts of our image. So I'm going to just leave that and then I'm going to click and then I'm going to click this button up here again to save it. And then I can simply overwrite this Razor Crest Passes EXR. Click Yes. Go back to After Effects. Right click Reload. And then we can add another pass. So we can go up to Refract, duplicate that, and then go to Reflection Gloss. So we don't actually composite with this directly. We can just leave this as a normal blending mode. But instead, we can start doing some kind of creative stuff with this. Because of metalness, a lot of our information and our reflection are kind of stuck in reflection here. If I wanted to kind of extract 
parts of the rough reflection versus the kind of glossy reflection, I can do that with this pass. So let me call this roughness. Now this is just going to be a mat for us. Now I can pull this underneath reflection. And then if I solo reflection, solo the OCIO layer, and then I say, all right, reflection, but I only want to show that where it's not rough. So where it's brighter. And then I turn off my transparency here. We've kind of extracted part of that metal now. So if I do the opposite, I can extract just the parts that are rough, which is kind of cool. So just by simply using that roughness as a mat, I could duplicate this, switch this one to Luma, unsolo all of these. This is still the same image that we had before, but now we have a little bit more control. Now we have reflections for the parts that are rougher and reflections for the parts that are shinier. And I can start doing some interesting things with those. I can turn this layer back off and I could do something like, hey, on the areas where it is, you know, shinier, I could grab a curves effect and then I could say, hey, I want to make those even brighter or just those areas. If I zoom in on here, see how we're making that part brighter. Or I could say, hey, you know what? I don't want to use that. Instead, I want to reset this. I want to make the reflection more saturated. So I could grab hue and saturation. Then I could say, hey, let's make that the reflection a little bit more bluish. I wanted, I wanted more blue in the reflection. And now I could do that. Or I could do that, you know, down here. And I could say, hey, on the rougher parts of that reflection, do the same thing. I actually want that to be even grayer desaturated. Or I could do the opposite and say, hey, I really wanted the rougher part to have more color. And then on the reflection down here, I didn't actually need that at all. And I just wanted to maybe really, really saturate that. Now there will be some crossover here because the rough parts do kind of mix a little bit with the non rough parts. It's not a simple black and white mask. It is grayscale. That's one thing that we can do with a utility pass, such as the glossiness pass or roughness. But we can do the same thing on regular passes as well, like specularity. So I could say, hey, on the specular parts, I actually want those to be a little bit tinted. So I could say, all right, I want to make these for some reason red. And I could make our, my specular reflections a little bit more reddish or I could reduce the red. I could make them a little bit greener for some reason, okay? Or I could say, hey, you know what? These weren't bright enough. I wanna make them even brighter. So we are gonna get some kind of false color areas if we don't go, if we go way too hot, hot with that. So we don't wanna do that. So we don't wanna have that go completely clipped. I'm gonna do something like this. But doing that makes our specularity a lot brighter. So you can begin to be creative with this. And at this point, since it's left Maya, you can do whatever you want. You're not breaking PBR or anything at this point because you've used PBR to get a rendered result that is physically correct. And now when you're in compositing, you can kind of do what you want. Now, of course, there are going to be certain rules of what looks good and what you should do. And it's going to be scene dependent but it does offers that level of flexibility. Or on the refraction, I could say, hey, I want to brighten that glass up, it's way too dark, no problem. Grab a curves, kind of crank those values over, and now we can see through the canopy a lot more clearly. And this is a really, really good example of something that's, it looks great, it looks fine, right? But if you had to go and re-render like an entire sequence of, let's say something that took an entire week to render just because you accidentally used an incorrect refraction setting inside Maya and it's now too dark and you can't see through very clearly. Well, if you have the refraction pass, you can easily fix that. So that is the benefit of using passes. So it's not always required in your professional life that you would have to use passes, but I always recommend it because even if you don't really make that many adjustments, 
And even if you didn't want to do something like change the roughness reflections versus the glossy reflections or stuff like that, there'll be one instance where you're like, oh, I wish I could just tint just that one aspect of it, or I wish that I could blur that one section or something like that. It's always good to get in the habit of using passes or AOVs, whatever you like to call them. Okay, so I hope that was helpful. So next we're going to talk about render layers. So I'm going to clear all this because we're going to do it all over again because practice makes perfect. Okay, so back in Maya, I'm actually going to get rid of this glossiness pass. And we can leave all of this as it is for right now. Later on, we'll go through what all of these things do. But for right now, we really don't need anything except for changing the resolution. So we will change that a little later. All right, guys, thanks for watching. The next video, we're going to be taking a little bit of a detour and going over VDB sequences. So I'm trying to build up a scene that we can use render layers for, a more complex scene. So I'm going to be loading in some VDB clouds. And if you're interested in how to do that in V-Ray, stay tuned for the next video.